Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Coffee with Rob. We are in March chapter four. Hope everybody's doing good, enjoying the end of their summer, or hope you're not missing your kids too much. I know a lot of them went back to school. I gotta say congratulations to my, my friend Rick. His uh, brother graduated from RASP this week, so congratulations. And um, anyway, um, we're gonna be in Mark chapter four, a common passage of scripture, a well-known passage of scripture. It's uh, about the parable of the sower. And so let's go ahead and begin in verse one. Uh, this is study number 13 this week, 13. So I gotta write that down, 13. All right, so uh, it says again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. This is a common place. What a great place on the beach, on the lake. That's, that's awesome. The crowd, gathered, the crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat on it out in the lake. Now remember, earlier he was walking by the lake. Then he said, have a boat prepared for me. And he got in it and taught. Now this time, the crowd is so large uh, that he had to get in the boat and push out off the shore a little ways for his safety. He went out onto the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. And maybe he did that as well so people could hear him better. His voice would carry across the water. If you've ever been on the water, you know that even in the still a night or when it's quiet, if there's a boat even several hundred yards away, you can hear the people talking. The sound carries very well. So um, he taught them many things by parables. Now parables are interesting because they're uh, you know an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And if Jesus didn't define the parable, it would seem like a riddle. Like, if what does this mean to us? Obviously, he uses common things, things that are common to people when he teaches the parable. Like, for example, here, this is going to be, he's in an agricultural environment, a fishing environment, but certainly in an agricultural environment. And he uses uh, an agricultural illustration to get his point across. So he's on the shore. He's got a crowd around him. Again, Mark says he's right here where he always is. He's probably in Capernaum above Galilee, just left Peter's house, we would assume. And he's walking along. This time he gets out in the boat and he starts teaching. And he says in verse three, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he scattered the seed, some fell along the path. That's number one. So you're gonna have three types of soil here. And you're gonna have um, three types of bad soil, three types of good soil. So that's interesting. Just a comparison. Three types of bad soil, three types of good soil. Some seed fell along the path. Now I'm just going to go ahead and skip ahead a little bit. We know that we are the sower. We That's our responsibility. First Corinthians 3, and I've taught on this recently, we have uh, you know, four jobs really in the kingdom of God. One is to plant the seed. One is to water the seed. One is to be patient and wait on God. And the next one is to harvest. And so we have the responsibility of three out of four, to plant, to water, to wait, and to harvest. So really it's just the three, plant, water, and harvest. And we wait on God for the increase. So a farmer goes out, he's sowing the seed. The seed is the word of God. And by the way, the word of God is perfect. The seed is perfect. There's nothing wrong with the seed. The issue today even, the issue back then even, isn't the seed. It isn't the Word of God, which represents the Word of God. It's the heart of man, which is depicted as a soil or is the soil. The soil, the heart of man is the problem. The soil, the mind, the things that we have to overcome or, or, or as individuals in order to hear the Word. We have to be willing to receive and hear the Word of God. But the seed's perfect. It's flawless. There's nothing wrong with it. And so... The seed, he takes the seed, which is the word of God, and he scatters the seed. Some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell along rocky places where it didn't have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. So the thorns choked out the plants and you've seen this when the weeds get into your crops i just had this with tomatoes that i planted they choked them out they couldn't grow anything in some places some places it grow very well they choked the plants out so they didn't bear grain still another uh, seed fell on good soil so we had three bad soils when we look at this and we had the path the rocky places and the thorns those are the bad soils and these are the good soils that came up 
uh, on the good soil and it came up and it grew and it produced a crop multiplying three good soils 30 60 or a hundred times now I think if you're a gardener and I'm not an experienced farmer but it sounds to me like 30 times what I sow is pretty good 60 times better and a hundred times what I sow has got to be extremely profitable and so I think that would be very encouraging and I think as farmers got Jesus had these people's attention like wow what is the soil give us the soil but what he's really referring to is the seed and the condition of the receiver, which would be the heart of man. Are you prepared to hear the word of God? Do you want to hear the word of God? So many things distract us from hearing the word of God. The biggest one today is me, myself. I don't want to hear it. I'm too prideful. It hurts my feelings, whatever. But, you know, it's to be an encouragement. Let's be an encouragement to each other. The, the word of God is perfect. And it'll make a better person. It'll give you a better future. It can look out for it. It's not going to give you the answer to all your prayers like Joel Osteen and all these other people talk about. If you name it and you claim it and you pray for it, you'll get it. No, because we'd all be millionaires. And we're not all millionaires, so that's a false gospel. The gospel truth is, let's read the Word of God. Let's learn how to be um, good custodians of this life that we've been given, this body we've been given. Take care of your equipment. Take care of your body. Take care of your brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus and preach the gospel. That's sowing the word. So when he was alone with the twelve, the others around him asked him about the parable. He told them the secret of the kingdom of God. So he has to explain. It's hot, by the way. Sorry. Uh, he told them the secret of the kingdom of God. So this would just be a riddle to some if they didn't, you know, they weren't really ready to listen. Like some people come to church and they hear you, but they're not really listening. They're not really, they're not really hearing. They're listening, but they're not really hearing. In other words, they're not, they're not grabbing what you're saying. They're not applying what you're saying. They're not thinking deeper. One of the things I think we need today, even in America, we need more critical thinkers. I think commonly the schools teach kids how to take tests and be great test takers. But do we really understand what we're writing down? Do we really understand why we're writing it down? Do we under, and, and as a believer, do you really understand what and why you believe what you believe? That's the challenge, and we should be helping each other do that. So the think, secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those who are outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may ever be seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. So basically, if you want to hear, you can hear it. If you want to resist, you can resist it. And if you want to hear, you'd be around listening to Jesus. Hey, tell us what that means. And that's what these disciples did. Tell us what this means. And so he did. So Jesus says in verse 13 of Mark chapter 4, Don't you understand this parable? How will you understand any parable? The farmer sows, as I said earlier, the word of God. Some people are like the seed along the path. Um, where the word is sown, as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. In other words, he throws out something more attractive. And he knows your weaknesses, whatever it may be. It may be a promotion at work. It may be whatever it may be. You define that for yourself. You know what your weakness is. You know what you want really bad. And isn't it amazing that the moment you take a step towards God, the devil says, hey, by the way, I know you've been waiting on this a long time. And here it is. And the whole purpose is to get you away from following God. So he pulls the word out. You get distracted because... Um, the word is in, but now you're not holding on to it because you found something better. It's like the, my dog, when I go in the backyard, and he's got a bone and I take it and then I kick a can and he goes after the can. Then I take the bone and I throw the bone. He goes after the bone. It's just, it's just what the devil's doing with mo a lot of us throwing something else out there that, you know, very, very easily distracted. So they hear it. Satan comes and take away the word that was sown in them. Others are like the seed sown on rocky places. They hear the word they, once they receive it with joy. It's exciting. It's real. It's true. We all know it's true. Every person on the planet has a God-shaped hole right in the center of their heart. And when the word comes in, we know, man, this is, this is something different about this. Something, this is making me feel funny. Something's, something's odd. I can either respond or not respond. Unless you've seared your conscience and you don't care, well, God will leave you alone. Romans chapter 1. He will give you over, give you over, give you over to whatever you in if you pursue it. And he'll block him out. He'll give you your wish. I don't want Jesus. I just want the blessings. Well, eventually you won't get those either because you turned your back on God. I'm sorry I'm sweating today, but wow, this is really crazy. So they hear it. Satan comes and say, the rocky places hear the word at once. They receive it with joy. 
But since they have no root, in other words, they have no history. They have no, they haven't sat down and really studied the doctrine. They haven't really sat down and memorized verses. So I wrote some things, just some thoughts. The rocky places, no root, no history, no depth. They have a stronger interest or they have a greater root in different things, whatever that may be. So um, the, 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 the strength and their root is not in the word of God. Their identity is in other things. I think I talked about that before. When you meet people that are 60, 70, 80 years old or younger, whatever, they talk about things in the past. That's what their identity is. 30, 40, 50 years ago, they've done nothing new. And what kills me today is guys like, like me, I'm 55. And I, and I, it's crazy to hear guys that say, you know, things like what they did in high school. Nothing wrong with that. But when you hear it constantly or in college, we're 30 years away from college. I'm 40 years away from, from high school. That was in the past. My identity is there no longer. I'm moving forward. I'm looking forward. I'm somebody new. I'm a new creature in Christ. I'm doing new things. You know, I've got a master's degree. I'm a pastor. I was a police officer. I'm a military guy. All behind me. Now it's about what I'm doing going forward. What are we going to do? And everybody should have that attitude. It's great that a part of what I did is a part of me today. But it's no longer my identity. It's a part of who I am. It's great to talk about. But if you aren't creating new identities as you go forward, then you're stuck in the past. Keep moving forward. Put the past behind you. Go out and conquer new things. Dream dreams. Kids in their teens are doing that. They're excited. They're moving forward. Their root is in the future, not in the past. They're looking for you know going to college, having a family, getting married, you know, climbing mountains, paragliding, whatever it might be, joining the military. Um, so anyway, the rocky places, they had no root. So the root's in something other than the Word of God. Their identity is in something other than following Jesus Christ. So it only lasts a short time. It's exciting for a moment, and then they go away. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they fall away. Why? Because they have no root. Oh, this is crazy. I went to a party last night. I started talking about Jesus, and everybody started laughing at me. That's because what you have is real. It takes a stronger person to swim upstream than to swim downstream. So, you know, I don't Anyway, you want to be strong in Christ Jesus. Your root should be in it. Don't get distracted. Don't be worried if somebody somebody is going to say something about you. It happens to me all the time. I don't care. Bounce right off. My identity is in Christ. You can say whatever you want. I don't answer to anybody but Jesus Christ. So that's our attitude. That's the way we should be. Now, I want to like everybody. I want to get along with everybody. I want to help people. But if you don't like me or don't approve of me, that's on you, not me. I'm not going to do anything to offend you if I can help it. So, and if I do, I'll apologize. So they quickly fall away. They wanted the, So they were along the path. Then they're on the rocky places. Still other seed uh, was among thorns. They hear the word, but the worries of this life. This is, oh, the bills are coming in. I got deadlines at work. Man, the devil will throw these at you. These aren't necessarily sins. Because these are things that may, and these are on Christians and non-Christians. Everybody has to pay bills. Everybody has medical issues. Everybody has family issues. Everybody has, you know, I'm not saying marital issues. But you got to worry about the kids. You got to worry about deadlines. A car needs an oil change. You blew a tire on the way to work. All these things happen and they can be overwhelming unless you purpose in your life to make God a priority. Then it's very easy to get caught up and choked out. The word will get choked out. You'll start thinking about it and forget about the word altogether. Could be career decisions. I remember working with the Joint Chiefs of Staff down in Fort Sam Houston, General Paul Asher, right before General Colin Powell took over. I worked with a man named Steve Hilliard. He's still a great friend of mine back in the 80s. And we were doing security and driving for three general officers and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. A General Palastro was about to retire and Colin Powell was about to take over for him as a Joint Chiefs of Staff. When we would go to the room to see General Palastro in the morning, he was not to be disturbed. I believe it was from 6 to 7. And so one day I asked him, how come you don't like anybody knocking on your door between 6 and 7? He said, because that's when I'm having time with my Lord. I'm reading my Bible, and I'm studying. Now, I mean, he's a Joint Chiefs of Staff. He, he was a busy man. He had a lot on his shoulders. And he had been in the military a long time. And he could have let the military distract him, but he took a moment every morning for an hour to get alone with God and pray. And man, wouldn't we have a great country if all our leaders did that? And I'm not saying everything would be perfect. And I'm not saying he was perfect. But what an inspiration to a young E4 at the time Working at Sam Houston, he says, I get alone with God every day for an hour before I do anything. Wow, 
and then, then Colin Powell took over, got to work with him, and he would make a point to go around and talk to everybody that he worked with. He didn't care if you were E2 or a general officer. He wanted to meet you. He was a great guy, too. So anyway, work with a lot of cool guys. Um, these men were focused. They did not let things distract them, and you shouldn't let things distract you from following Jesus Christ. Set time aside. An appointed side. Daniel did this. Uh, you know, Noah did this. Everybody that is a powerful or is influential on the, in the kingdom is somebody who sets aside time for God, and you should, or we should as well, and I try to, for sure, absolutely. But the thorns come in, they'll choke the word, make it unfruitful. In other words, you're so distracted, you're worthless. You may be saved, but you're worthless, maybe. I don't know how this, particularly in the depth of this. So anyway, other seed is sown on good soil. These are people that hear the word. They accept the word. They produce a crop. Now, this is the responsibility for every believer to hear the word, to accept the word, produce a crop. Remember, uh, in 2 Corinthians 3, Paul said, uh, one plants, one waters, God gives the increase, and then we have the privilege of harvesting. This is it. We produce a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. And we have to keep going. And I want to jump down, though, from verse 20 down to verse 26, because this kind of goes together. So if you have 2 Corinthians 3, Matthew, or excuse me, Mark 4, uh, 1 through 20, and, and these all tie in, but 26 ties in the best. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Our responsibility. That's our responsibility to water it. Verse 27. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows. Why? Because the seed is perfect and God gives the increase. It doesn't matter what you do. The seed's going to do what it does. The word's going to do what it does. You can't make it do, uh, you can't make an apple seed produce an orange. You can't do it. And so it's going to do what it does. It's going to grow the way it does. And really we can kind of maybe influence some of it through GMOs, all that crazy stuff. But, but this is just typical seed. At night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and it grows. Why? Because that's what seed does. If you plant the word of God, believe me, and you plant it in somebody's heart, in somebody's mind, you talk about it, believe me, in their mind, they're thinking about it. And whether they get saved or not, that's between them and God. But he, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. And that's the key. We don't necessarily know how or when our sowing and our watering is going to produce fruit. But that's our responsibility before God to produce fruit. It's God's responsibility to produce the increase. We're, I mean, it's our responsibility to sow the seed, water the seed, and then God gives the increase to produce the fruit. And then when it, the great thing is, it's like I got a call the other day. We have a young man in our church. When I, the last church I was at, his name is Cy. I love this little guy. He's a wrestler. He's a football player. And he says to his grandma, will, will Pastor Rob come back and baptize me? And I'm like, yes, I will. So I didn't do anything but pray with him, do a little bit of investing in him. He was seeking God. His grandmother, his family is investing in him. His church family is investing in him. And one day he says, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. And so we're going to baptize him. It's going to be amazing. But God gives that increase. And God's going to have a special plan for that little man. I can't wait to see what he does and what he becomes. But God gave the increase. We were patient. I was at that church for 12 years. And finally, Sai says, I want to be baptized. I want to give my life to Jesus. So that's going to be a great day. God gave the increase. We get the privilege of harvesting for the kingdom of God. So I hope everybody has a great day. I hope this encourages you. Know that you're going to sow seed that people aren't going to listen to. Don't be worried about that. You did your job. You sowed the perfect seed. Whether people receive or not is up to them. And I know it can be tough sometimes, but hang in there. Keep sowing. Because as you sow, uh, it will eventually there's gonna, you're going to produce a crop, and you're going to get the privilege of harvesting 30, 60, and 100 times what you sowed. And eat regardless, sowing and watering and waiting on God is still going to produce a reward in heaven for you. Although works don't save you, your works will be, uh, uh, your, your rewards will be a direct result of your works in heaven. We get to heaven by grace, through faith, through the blood of Jesus Christ. So uh, the works are just a bonus when we get there to be hopefully rewards when we get there in heaven. So 
Hope you're doing good. Tomorrow we'll start back in Mark chapter 4. Uh, that was the parable of the sower. And uh, everybody have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow.